Hey, Waynesburg family, thanks again for joining us this Sunday morning for WCC Online Church. Uh, we are looking forward to sharing in a time of worship. We're looking forward to sharing in uh, the last half of Psalm 139 today as we finish out our Refuge series. And we're going to share a time of communion at the end of our service as well. Hey, I want to give you a couple of quick reminders. Um, next Sunday, uh, one of our members, Reuben Kissel, who has been a Gideon for a long time, is going to be sharing a Gideon message uh, with us next Sunday. That will be both online and in person, so I wanted to let you know about that. And also next Sunday, our, um, our church family, is in the in-person services, we're going to be starting our children's Sunday school time back up again. So I wanted to let you know uh, about that as well. If you're interested in being a part of that, or if your family plans to come and you haven't let Shaylee know already, uh, please let her know so that she can plan uh, for resources and, and volunteers accordingly. Uh, thanks again for being with us, and we look forward to worshiping together this morning.
started talking about reminder notes and how uh, sometimes in our family we need we leave reminder notes about you know uh, doing the dishes or make sure that you add to the grocery list or don't forget this or don't forget that. And we looked at Psalm 139, excuse me, we looked at Psalm 139 uh, because Psalm 139 is a huge reminder note that God has in his word for us today. And there's really four reminders uh, that Psalm 139 gives us. And last week we talked about the first two. Uh, the first reminder was that God knows you. That he knows everything about you, that he knows uh, the thoughts that are in your mind, he knows the words that are on the tip of your tongue before you even speak them. He knows all there is to know about you. And even though he knows you and he knows everything about you, he loves you anyway, which is an amazing thought. We, we looked at how that just that thought blew David's mind that he is fully known, but he's fully loved anyway. And the second reminder that, that we find that we talked about in Psalm 139 last week was that God pursues you, that he is present everywhere, that no matter where you go, you cannot flee from his presence. You cannot get away from where he is. There's nowhere you can go where God isn't. And so <clears throat> those two reminders were really, really important for us to learn last week that God knows us and that God pursues us. And today we're going to finish out uh, looking at Psalm 139, we're going to finish out our refuge series this morning. Uh, but as a reminder, you know, Psalm 139 has four sections and there's six verses long each. And those first two sections tell us God knows us and that God pursues us. And then today we're going to look at these last two sections. And they're two really, really important reminders for us as well. And the first reminder that we're going to talk about today, or the third reminder uh, for the entire psalm is this, is that God made you. God made you. And that's such a huge thing to think about uh, because origins, the, the question of origins matters. Uh, where did we come from? Uh, how did we get here? You know, is, is there a God whose hand is in all of this or are we just here uh, by chance or by happenstance or by some sort of other process that took place? Well, this is a huge, huge question and it has huge implications for us. Uh, but Psalm 139 reminds us that God himself was involved in our creation, that God himself made us. Look, look at uh, verses 13 through 15 with me. Look at what David writes. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The literal translation of that is that the literal Hebrew there is I am fearfully wonderful. It's, it's awe-inspiring that, that God would make us so fearfully and wonderfully. He says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. And this really flows right along with those first two, th two points, that only the God who knows us so well, and only the God who is everywhere present with us, only that kind of God could also have a hand in our creation. And so the God that knows us and is near us is intimately involved in making us. David stacks up these descriptive words again in verses 13 through 50. You created my inmost being. You knit me together. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you. I was woven together long before modern medical technology could give us a glimpse inside of the womb. Uh, David here is declaring that God is molding and shaping little ones, even as they are developing inside of the womb. Doctors say that just 28 days into pregnancy, uh, that a little human life is, is just a little half inch long human life. And that this little human, this 28 days into pregnancy, has already, had, already has a developing brain and a beating heart. Isn't that a miracle? Isn't that just a miraculous? I mean, um, we are blessed there not to have four children. And, and just that whole process of, 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 being, <laughs> of, of Sarah being pregnant and, and being able to, to reach my hand down and, and feel her belly and feel, feel a baby kicking with his feet or, or poking with his hands to, to hear a heartbeat. This is just a miracle of God, uh, the, the whole pregnancy process and, and then finally being there uh, for the birth 
of my kids. It's just a miraculous, amazing experience. And it has a, it has a way of changing us. It has a way of changing people. But um, God made us. And it's not just a miracle, but it's a miracle that matters oh so very much because of that question of origins. This question of, of origins is, is huge because we, have, we all have to answer this question or have an idea of where do we come from. And there are really two popular answers. The two most popular answers, I think, are, are that we are, are here by the process of evolution or that we are here because God created us. Now, when I went to, to Bible college and, and seminary, uh, there is a scientist that, that worked at our school at the time. His name was Kurt Pete Wise. And, and since then, he's moved on to another college. He works at a college in Tennessee now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but Kurt P. Wise did this presentation about what Darwinism says about us. And I will never, ever forget that presentation. There were, were two little paragraphs, two little uh, points, two sentences um, that really demonstrated the difference between what evolution says of us and what creation or what the Bible says of us. Let me, let me read that to you. Kurt Weiss uh, wrote this. Evolution indicates that you're unforeseen, unchosen, unplanned, and uncared for. That you're an unfor unforeseen, unchosen, unplanned, uncared for, soulless, spiritless animal, no greater than a blade of grass or bacterium brought about by death and struggle. In that war, or at least in competition, against everything else in the world. That is the theory of evolution. That's what evolution says about us. But listen to what the Bible says about us. The Bible indicates that you are long foreseen, individually chosen, carefully planned, specially fashioned, continually nourished image of God with personhood, soul, and spirit, created to have fellowship with the living and loving God and to oversee the world he has created. That's quite the contrast, right? Let's look, at it. Let's look at it again, side by side. Evolution says of you, you're unforeseen, unchosen, unplanned, uncared for, soulless, spiritless animal. You're living according to the survival of the fittest. And the Bible right next to that says, uh, in comparison and con contrast says, that you are long foreseen, individually chosen, carefully planned, specially fashioned, you're an image of God with personhood, soul, and spirit, living in fellowship uh, with the living and loving God. This is such a huge question that we have to answer. I know when I compare those two things, I know when I compare those two things, which one I want to be true. I want it to be true that my life is meaningful, that my life matters, that I'm not just here uh, be, because of some random accident that just happened by chance or, happened, or that happened by circumstance. I want, my life, I want to know that my life matters. I want to know uh, that this, this whole experience on this, this little earth, this little planet in the, the vast solar system, that all this matters. And the Bible says that all of this matters, this life matters, and not only that, the Bible says that you and I matter. Life is not meaningless. Life is not empty. We have purpose, and we have meaning. And that purpose and that meaning begins in the heart and the mind of God. Uh, why does the question of origins matter so much? Because if God made me, then that has huge implications. If God made me, then my life and every life has dignity and value. This is a reality. God doesn't make junk. God doesn't make anything just to throw it away. This means that the people of every race deserve equal dignity and rights. It means that elderly people, the seriously ill, the mentally disabled, children yet unborn, they all deserve full protection and honor as human beings. Every person has value. Every kid that visits, visits uh, Waynesburg from the, from the Columbus Behavioral Center, they need to know this message. 
that God made them, he shaped them, and he formed them. And, and even if other people have treated them as, as throwaway kids or, or, throw, or that their lives are just throwaway lives, or if they've just been mistreated, they need to know and understand that the God of the universe sees them, loves them, and knows them. That he made them with purpose. Every teenager needs to be reminded of these verses. You are more than your social status. You are more than your grades. You are more than your last athletic performance. Your value is not determined uh, by what other people think of you. Your value is not determined by how you measure up. Your value is determined because the living and loving God of the universe created you and made you special. Every teenager needs to have that message drilled down deep into their heart. Every kid needs to latch on to that. In a few weeks, we're, we're going to be joining with, with uh, one of our mission partners, Clarity, and what they call a baby bottle campaign. And Keegan's put together uh, some details about that in, in our newsletter that's gone out. Um, uh, why, why do we do stuff like that with Clarity? Because Clarity understands and makes it their mission to, to, to let people know that every life Matters that the life of the unborn matters. And so we're going to join with them in that baby bottle campaign here in a few weeks. And I hope that you'll, uh, that you'll take out Psalm 139, that you'll read it to your kids, and that they can understand that the reason why we're, we're putting a little bit of cash in this baby bottle is so that, uh, so that new mommies and so that the, the little ones can have a fresh, uh, man, just a fresh beginning with Jesus. And they can know the value of life. So one, Psalm 139 makes it very clear that every life has dignity and value. Not only does Psalm 139 show me that, that my life has dig dignity and value and that the lives of others have dignity and value, but it also shows to me and reveals to me that my life is God's project. Look at what, what verse 16 says. It says, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were ordained for me. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I love that, that first little section uh, that, that David says, God, your eyes were on me. God, your eyes were on me. And, and that, that's a personal thing. Uh, God's eyes weren't just on this mass of tissue in the mother's womb. God's eyes weren't just on a potential life. In his mother's womb. God's eyes were on David. Not a nameless fetus, but a little human. God's eyes were on David. And so, so God, God has plans and purposes for David. He says, your eyes were on your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days or day for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's just an incredible thought to think about. And only the God who knows everything about us, who's always present and, and who created us, can also ordain our days. What, what does that word ordain mean? It's, it's an interesting word from, from the Old Testament, but it's most frequently used, and it can be used, um, in connection with a potter who forms clay on a wheel. And the potter, what, what does the potter do with the clay? He shapes it, he molds it, he, he, he pulls at it, he presses it until uh, the lump of clay takes the shape that he has in mind. Now, I'm not an artist, and I certainly can't work with clay, but it makes me think of Plato. I'm sure uh, many of you know what Plato is, and you probably uh, got it underneath your fingers playing as a kid or, or, or with your grandkids or with your own children. Uh, but I, it makes me think of Plato. And the idea here that David is sharing is that God takes our days and that, that God forms them, that God molds our days, that God shapes our days so that he can mold and shape us into the people that he wants to be. Now, I'm not a, an artist, but I got Laura Beth, I got LB to, to make a little something for me. She's, she's good with the clay. She made me a, a little... A little head made out of play I'll, I'll show you the close-up because I'm really proud of it. I love it. I, I see this and it, it just makes me think of that Lionel Richie video, Hello. <laughs> it makes me think of that video. I mean, uh, 
at least the, the only thing better than this is, is that, that head from the Lionel Richie video, hello. But, but God's, God's word here for us is that, that our days take shape because God makes them take shape. That our lives are his project. That, that he has a certain person that he wants us to be. He wants us to be the best version of us possible. And so he molds us and he shapes us. And he, and he puts us in circumstances. And he, he allows things into our life that are going to mold us and shape us and help us to become the people that he wants us to be. And so here in Psalm 139, we see and we understand that my life is valuable because God made me. And because God made me, I also need to yield, I also need to submit to this idea that my life is God's project. And I can do the best I can to put my hands on God's project, uh, to, to manipulate things and to make things work how I want them to work. But we ultimately need to step back and take our hands off and say, okay, Lord, this, this life of mine, uh, I'm not going to grasp onto it really, really hard, but God, I'm going to be open-handed about it and yield my life to you, God, and say, God, my life is your project. All the days ordained for me, all the days formed for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And this also blows David's mind. Look, look at what he says. Uh, my life is God's project. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, in verse 17. How vast is the sum of them. Why to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. This thought that, that God molds and shapes our days, that, that his thoughts towards us are, are so vast and so, uh, so spectacular, and they're, they're so big, there's so many of them, that, that counting them would be, uh, it would be like counting grains of sand. And that, that last little phrase there in, in verse 18, he says, when I wake, I'm still with you. Uh, there's a couple of different ways we can look at that. Um, you know, if, if we were to count all of God's thoughts towards us, it would probably put, it, put us to sleep because we could never count all of God's thoughts towards us. But when I wake, God's presence is there with me. That, that, that phrase, when I wake, could also uh, be interpreted as, um, as that when, when things come to an end. And so the idea with that would be that when I come to the end, God is still with me. God is still there. He knows everything about me. He pursues me. He's always present with me. He created me. My life has dignity and value because of God. And my life is God's project. And that just blows David's mind. And so the first three portions of this psalm are like this incredible hymn of praise, just praising God for his knowledge, for his presence, for his creative power. And then the psalm takes this really, this really sharp turn. <laughs> the psalm takes this really sharp turn, and, and it moves away from this, um, this high and, and holy prayer of praise, this high and holy song, giving praise to God. It's almost as if David is looking up, giving him praise uh, for, for all that he has done, for all that he is. And then it seems as if David brings his gaze back down and he starts to look around. And the psalm takes a hard left-hand turn. And it moves from being uh, the, this hymn of, of prayer and praise to being a personal plea. Um, you know, this summer, Anna got her driver's license. And as part of that, she, she went and she did a driving school where she took some, some tests online. She had uh, a few hours where she rode with one of her instructors. But we had to fill out this law where she said, where we acknowledged that, you know, she had 50 driving hours with me or Sarah or this, or this other driving instructor. And she did great with it, and we're really proud of her, as, as always. Um, but it got Sarah and I reminiscing about, you know, when we had driver's ed, driver's ed in high school. And, you know, we, we could take driver's ed as, as one, one of the classes in high school for, uh, for one of our semesters. And, and we were reminiscing and just talking about that. And Sarah said that, that one day there was this really funny thing that happened in her driver's ed class. She wasn't driving. It was somebody else. It was another girl in her class. 
And, and this girl was driving, um, and, and Sarah and, and another person went in the car, and then the driver's ed instructor was in, in the car as well. And they were going back to South Decatur from Westport. And as they left Westport, you know that she's supposed to turn on, this girl is supposed to turn on her cruise control. So she had it on cruise control, probably like at 55 miles an hour back then. And, and they got close to the school and the driver's ed teacher said, okay, we'll go ahead and, and turn into the school. And without touching the brake, without turning the cruise control off, she just whipped it into, into the parking lot. From, from Highway 3, and, and turn, they did a hard left-hand turn, and Sarah said that her books went flying, her head and her face hit the window beside her, and the, and the driver's ed teacher finally slowed him, slowed him down enough, and he just looked over, and was like, what are you doing? You gotta hit your brake before you turn into the parking lot at 55 miles an hour. Well, here in this psalm, David's given us a hard left-hand turn. You might feel your face, you know, smash against the window a little bit here. Uh, but let's, let's look at what David, look at what David writes. He's transitioning from this, this prayer uh, and hymn of praise to a desperate personal plea. Look at what David writes, verse 19. If only you God would slay the wicked... Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. You feel that hard left, don't you? Uh, where David is, is turning, and, and he's not just doing uh, this, this, this prayer, this, this time of praise, but he's making a desperate plea. The desperate plea begins... Uh, and the overarching thing is this, God, I need you. Number four, God, I need you. But David brings his gaze down and he starts to look around and he, he understands that God is all-knowing. God is ever-present. God is a, is a powerful creator. But when he looks around and he looks at his circumstances, he sees that, they're, that his circumstances are not great. And, and the Psalms are really interesting because the Psalms give us the gamut of emotions. And you see here the, the gamut of emotions with David. He, he goes from praising God to being really angry and frustrated. And it just is like, God, would you just go ahead and, and wipe out the wicked? Uh, they're making my life miserable. Uh, when, when he looks down, look at some of these descriptions. He says in verse 19 that, that the, these, these people are bloodthirsty. The Hebrew there literally means men of blood. Now, I don't know what you have to do to get the nickname or the label uh, that you are a man of blood, uh, but it's pretty evident that these were violent men. In other Psalms, uh, this word is used to refer to violent men or to murderers. Uh, we find in verse, um, in verse 20, they, they misuse the name of God. In verse 21, they hate God. And they hate David because he is associated with God. And so David says that, you know, he hates them. And, and, and hate in the Hebrew language uh, means something a little bit different. It has to do more with an association that, um, that if I hated someone, I had nothing to do with them. It would be like turning their back, uh, turning your back on people. So these people that hate God are, are hate. They, they do not associate with God. They do not associate with God's people. And David says that he will not associate with them, that, that word of whore in verse uh, 21 is more of an emotional phrase. It would be to be like to be grieved or to be sickened. So what do we do with these verses? What do we do when we hear David praying? This, this man that's after God's own heart, what do we do with this thing where he's praying for God to just wipe out the wicked? Well, that could be a whole other sermon in and of itself, but today I'm going to give you four, four really quick points. Let's look at them together. How should we respond to this? Uh, what do we take away from this? First bullet is this. Believers should not take it upon themselves to exact revenge, uh, to exact vengeance for wrongdoing. God is the righteous judge. 
Now, I've, I've given you some verses through here. And this is definitely not an exhaustive list, but if you want to look these things up, you can. Uh, but believers should not take it upon ourselves to exact vengeance for wrongdoing. We trust that God is the avenger, that he is the one who is the righteous judge and has the right uh, to bring judgment on people. Uh, second bullet, David is asking God to act against the wicked. David is asking God to move against the wicked. David showed great personal restraint in his own past uh, when Saul uh, was against him. So David showed great restraint and refused to take vengeance against Saul when he had the opportunity to in 1 Samuel 24 and in 1 Samuel 26. Third bullet, Christians should pray for their enemies. Jesus tells us to do that. Uh, we should pray for our enemies, but we should also pray for the Lord to restrain evil and to restore justice. So it is fine to pray for those things. And the last one is very, very important uh, as it pertains to this psalm. David is, aware that, David is aware of his own potential for wrong motives or wrong doing. David realizes uh, that he might be on the, the emotional edge here. And, and mindfulness is, is a really popular thing these days. And mindfulness is about be getting above your thoughts and examining your thoughts and being mindful and, and aware of your own thinking of, and of your own thoughts. And David here, uh, in the last two verses, you know, gives us a biblical example of mindfulness. Look at what he says. He, he transitions this prayer uh, from God save me from these people that are bloodthirsty, that want to do me harm. That is his first prayer, God save me. But he transitions it in, in his last two prayers here in these two verses are this, Lord, search me and Lord, lead me. Look at what he writes. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David prays, uh, and, and David is aware that his emotions are running high. David is aware that, that he, he's got this, this hatred, this anger, this frustration boiling up inside of him against those who hate God and, and those that hate him and that want to do him personal harm. And yet, this is what David, makes David a man after God's own heart. He realizes this, he feels this, and he, and he prays, God, search me. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. God, is there anything offensive in me? And lead me in your ways. You know, the posturing of, of so many people in our, in our day and age, the, the posturing of so many people that are outraged about so many things is, is about pointing the finger at everybody else. And in verses 19 through 22, you can say, you know what? David resembles a lot of the posturing that's going on in our world today. But verses 23 and 24, man, David shifts. And he says, uh, God, not only do I feel frustration towards these other people, and God, not only am I angry with these other people, but God, I need to make sure that I keep myself in check. God, I need you to keep me in check. God, I don't want uh, these emotions to take me down a path where I'm going to uh, bring offense to your name. God, I don't want these emotions to take me down a path where I'm going to do something that I regret. God, I don't want these emotions to take me down a path where I'm going to do something wrong in your sight. And so he prays, God, search me. And God, lead me. In light of the fact that you are the God who knows everything about me, in light of the fact that you are the God who is ever present with me, in light of the fact that you are my awesome and powerful creator, God, I need you to search me, and I need you to lead me. That is the example that David gives us to follow here in this last couple of verses of Psalm 139. A few months ago, um, I, I was taking a shower, and I noticed right below my waistband, there was this lump underneath my skin. I was like, hmm, well, that, that's not normal. So I went to the, I called the doctor, I went to the doctor, and the doctor says uh, that I have a hernia, and that the only thing that's going to fix a hernia is surgery. I didn't even know what a hernia was, so I looked it up, and basically a hernia is when you've got a tear in your abdominal wall, and, you, and your intestines are kind of 
protruding out through that, and that's what was causing this lump underneath my waistband. And so the doctor says, you know what, we, we need to have surgery. So we scheduled surgery. I went to have surgery, and, and surgery went great, and I'm very thankful everything went fine. Um, but the thing that I remember, uh, as I got wheeled into that, that, that room, that operating room, uh, and as I got shifted over from, from, my, from my hospital bed to the surgery bed, was I remember looking up. And I looked up, and there's this gigantic uh, contraption that had what looked like to me like hundreds, it looked like to me hundreds of little lights. I don't know if they're LED lights, I don't know what kind of lights they are, but it looked like there were hundreds of these little, little lights. And those lights weren't on yet, but those lights were going to be shining on me. Those lights were going to be shining on the spot that needed operation. And the surgeon was going to be able to, to cut me open. He's going to be able to, to, to bring me underneath the scalpel, cut me open with a knife, uh, push things back where they needed to be, put some reinforcement in that abdominal wall and sew me back up and send me on my way. This is what David is doing in the last two verses of Psalm 139. He's saying, God, put your searchlight on me. God, take, take your hundreds uh, uh, of lights uh, of holiness and wisdom and truth and shine them down into my heart. God, I feel the, the, this lump of anger rising up in my heart. God, I, I feel something not right in my spirit. God, so God, search me. God, test me. God, see if there's anything offensive in me. God, the thing that I want more than anything else is not, it, it, the thing I want more than anything else is to not offend you. It's so easy to worry about offending other people, but God, my priority needs to be not offending you. And so, God, shine your searchlight upon me and bring me under your scalpel and fix up whatever is going on in my heart and whatever is going on in my spirit. And so Psalm 139 closes out with this idea. The last half of it reminds us that God is our creator. Our life has value and our life has dignity because he made us. Not only does our life have value and dignity, but our life has purpose. And God molds us and shapes us and he shapes our days to help us to become the people that he wants us to be. And then David shifts and he, 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 he offers this, uh, this desperate prayer. God, rescue me from these enemies that are so bloodthirsty and murderous. God, rise up and, and defend the honor of your name. God, rescue me. God, save me. God, search me. And finally, God, lead me. Because you're my creator, because you know everything about me, because you're my, uh, the one who, who is ever present with me. God, I need you to walk forward with me into these days and into these moments where things are not perfect. And I'm going to trust you to lead me in the way everlasting. The Bible says that this kind of life is possible for us. The Bible says that we can know God in a personal way, just like David did. That we can have the life that God intended us to have. That we can become children of the all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful creator of the universe. And that that relationship starts with a step of faith towards Jesus. That relationship starts with a step of faith that says, Jesus, I admit that I need you. Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And it's a step that confesses, Lord, I need you to be my Lord. And Lord, I need you to be my Savior. God, would you rescue me? God, would you, would you put your hand upon me? God, would you search me out? And do the work in my heart that you need to do. It all starts with a step of faith today. Would you take that step? Would you step into the light? of God's presence and of God's love and allow him to walk with you into these days. Would you allow him to be your refuge? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you 
that you are good. We thank you and praise you that you are loving and that you are kind. God, we thank you and we praise you that, that our days are, are, are not accidental. God, that we are not here by accident or chance. God, you give our lives purpose. You give our lives meaning. You give us hope through Jesus. Help us to walk in that. Help us to live in that. And help us to share that love with others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, says this. It says, For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. So I want to start us off that, this morning with that verse. Where two, it says again, Where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Others say, Where two or more are gathered in my name, I am with them. I want to start us off with that because... I just want us to sit and remember that this morning. Whether you're sitting at home, as many of you are probably just sitting there with your family, just know that you guys are gathered together in his name. He's there with you. And even if you're sitting there in your household watching this, and it's just you, just know that through this online platform, we've allowed that opportunity for all of you, for each and every one of us when we need to, to come together through that. And even though it's through a screen, we're still lucky enough to live in this world where technology allows us to come together for the purpose to seek God and know more about Him. So let us rest at, in that this morning that as we come together and we get to celebrate in this time of communion, as we get to take the bread, take the juice, as He did all those years ago, we can also remember this verse that he said, For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. God is with us this morning. Whether you're watching online or if you happen to be in person. And not only does it have to be on a Sunday morning, but any time we decide to come together, two or more, in the Lord's name, he's with us. That's the best part about him. And so yes, this time of communion is a time that we will set apart in our service. But it's just a good reminder for us that it doesn't just have to be this time on a Sunday morning that we can say we're coming together. But it can be any time. Because again, we're two or more gathered in his name. He is with us. Let us remember that. And let us celebrate that this morning as we step into this time of communion, we take the bread, we drink the juice, and we do just as he commanded us. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us remember the sacrifice that came with the body that was broken and the blood that was shed that allows us to gather together two or more in his name and have him with us. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we get to celebrate that this morning. We thank you that we can come together through a screen in person and celebrate that all it takes is for two or more of us to join together in your name to let us know and remember that you're there with us. You're always with us, Lord, but something powerful when we come together two or more. And so whether it's together through a screen we're together in our own households. Whatever way it is, God, as we step in this time and we celebrate the sacrifice and do this in remembrance of you, let us remember that you are with us in this time. That it's not just a time set in our service where we do this, but it's a time to remember that you are with us always, especially when we gather in your name. In your I pray, amen.
your faith in him and you can acknowledge that faith in a prayer. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus a long time. You just need to know his presence and his comfort in a fresh way. We believe that he is one prayer away. If you've got questions about following Jesus, there's a link that says next steps here and that'll share with you some information about what it means to follow Jesus. There's, there's great stuff there and I invite you to check that out. Also, I want to invite you to check out our Facebook page. Uh, there you can find out all sorts of things that are happening at Waynesburg and with Waynesburg. And that also will give you uh, an opportunity to be in contact with us. Um, thanks again for being with us. We do pray that Jesus has made all the difference for you today. Have a great week. God bless.